you know, solidarity in the Asian and Black communities as an issue that has really actually been on the forefront over the last few years as the pandemic has um, been part of our lives. And so, you know, the last session, uh, employees spoke about what changes and what work they've done to center race and social justice in their work during the pandemic. And now we want to have uh, an opportunity to, to hear from you all about this really important issue that's really actually touching um, the work that we do in the city as well. So I'll do the land acknowledgement and then I'll pass it on to you, Mariko. Um, for folks uh, who know, you know, we, we are in the Pacific Northwest, we hear land acknowledgements all the time. It's almost like fashionable. It's almost like rote. I am going to do what I do, which is one, I source uh, some of the information from the Duwamish tribe.org website. And then I try to contextualize why and how it is we're doing the work in relation to decolonizing the space. Uh, you know, and I'll start by saying, you know, making a land acknowledgement has to do with learning the importance of honoring and acknowledging the land on which you live, work, and play. Um, and that this is a tradition that is, is born out of indigenous communities, is not a colonizer tradition, right? And so we sort of give it that respect and that's due. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. And we honor by extension the Coast Salish peoples and those indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest who cared for this land and who uh, who took care of these resources before we got here. Um, and in the discussion around race and social justice and talking about racial equity, you know, equity is about the redistribution of resources to those most in need in the ways most adequate. But when we're talking this work, we have to realize these resources, they're not even our resources, right? These are stolen resources. This is stolen land that we're on. The stolen resources that we want to talk about. The way in which we interact with our entire society starts from this colonial, um, this colonial act, you know, that really has caused like severe disruption. So when I would do trainings, I would say to folks, look, we wouldn't be in the tower if there wasn't massive disruption to communities. If, if this land wasn't stolen from people, if families weren't broken apart. We wouldn't be in this tower. We can say we had these offices. We can say we're doing any of this stuff. You see, I wouldn't be here if that didn't happen. And the history of displacement is not just for native folks in Seattle's history. It extends to Asian populations, it extends to the black community as well, where systemic um, uh, policy leads to displacement of whole communities of color. And so when we're doing a land acknowledgement, it's not like a fashion. It's to understand where we are um, in the work and to understand how it is we need to acknowledge where we're starting from and where we're trying to go. And really trying to think about what restorative justice looks like as we do racial equity work. All right. So that's all I have to add. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I would pass it on now to you, Mariko, and I will, I'm going to jump off camera. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, I always appreciate. Um, the sincerity you bring to the land acknowledgement so that really isn't rote and, um, and it is meaningful and, and gives us an opportunity to really think about our, our history of colonization. So I want to welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel with these amazing community organizers. Um, and, you know, as Kelly said, this is uh, such a timely topic. Um, you know, we've all been living well. First, let me introduce myself. Sorry about that. Um, Marika Lockhart, I am the director of the Seattle office for civil rights and I use she, her pronouns. I identify as black and Japanese. And, um, I guess that's also a reason why this, um, panel topic is so meaningful to me. I mean, it hits home. Um, you know, the issue that we're talking about today is. Long standing, it's not new um, the history of, um, you know, relationship that is both filled with tension and conflict, but also um, times of great solidarity between Asian and black communities. Goes back a long, long time in our history and. So, recently, it's really come to the forefront. So, with the um, protests for um, the movement for black lives, 
coming out of the um, murder of George Floyd in, in the summer of 2020, that sort of uplifting and um, just sort of widespread um, acknowledgement of um, the kind of anti-Black racism and um, brutality that Black people experience. And then with COVID, uh, this uptick, and there have been you know, numerous over our history, but this uptick in anti-Asian hate and violence, um, it seems like you know, we're all having um, an experience where um, our, our, um, our struggles find parallels and also opportunities to be in solidarity. Um, so um, we're really lucky to have these amazing panelists who are deep into community organizing and the work uh, and I'm going to ask them to each introduce themselves. I'm going to go ahead and call on people because, you know, it's sometimes uh, it's a little awkward. You don't know who's going to go. And also I can see each of you on my screen. So I'm just going to go in the order uh, that I see you. Um, David uh, Heppard, why don't you give us, uh, start us out? Oh, first. All right. Thank you, Michael. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is David Heppard. And um, he and him are my pronouns. I do my community work through the Freedom Project. Um, I always like to frame it in, in that way, in my understanding of how um, we try to show up in the way more consistent with our values of our community centered values and understand how the nonprofit industrial complex is another system that um, heaps impact on our community. Um, I am I identify as black and Korean. And when I was young and my immature, I used to say half black and half Korean. And as I started to mature and do my work, I, I started to understand that I'm not half of anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a whole person and I fully embrace um, all aspects of, of my identity and culture. And so that is my, as I start, as I continue to grow. And so this is just as medical stated, this is really connects to me because of of, of my how I identify and my lived experience, and I'm also directly impacted by one of the um, the the bludgeons that the society uses on our in our community, and that's mass incarceration. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much for that, David. Um, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. Uh, I use they them pronouns, and I. I'm a community organizer in different, several different grassroots groups. Um, I am in the Egg Rolls, which is a uh, mutual aid collective that uh, is sort of linked to Chumin, uh, a vegan Vietnamese uh, restaurant on Jackson and 12th. And I also support um, Massage part of the Outreach Project, which does outreach massage workers and support in uh, the International District. and um, in other areas around around Seattle. Um, I also make a podcast uh, about safety and what uh, safety means from an Asian American perspective as a part of the Pacific Rim Solidarity Network, um, Parasol, and also um, organized with the Mutual Aid Pantry and Burien and do language justice work uh, for immigrant justice in my paid work. So that's, yeah, just, I, I'm kind of all over the place, but um, also kind of relatively new to um, being this deep in community organizing in Seattle. Um, and I'm, yeah, excited to be here and learn from everyone. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Johnny, how about you next? Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Johnny Fickrew and I use he, him pronouns. Um, I got into community work as a student organizer. Um, I, I think kind of my, uh, you could say like boiling point or like what really got me moved uh, into doing some some work is what happened with Trayvon Martin. Um, so I'm 27 years old, and um, you know when you know what happened to Trayvon, I was like his age, and you know I grew up in Seattle and I grew up in predominantly white spaces and. I don't know, it, that was a moment that really shook me to my core, you know, and so I was um, fortunate to have mentors um, who kind of shaped me into being and and been very grateful to be accepted in, in community space. Um, I, my passions really stem from uh, doing organizing around environmental justice, 
uh, particularly around food, food access and food justice and, and more importantly, like food sovereignty, right? It's like, how do we, um, you know, grow our own food and, and take care of it, us while we're fighting against all these, you know, systems. Um, I also do um, a bit of mutual aid organizing and I'm uh, so grateful that Alex is here because uh, Alex and I both do the mutual aid organizing uh, on 12th and Jackson at Chumin Tofu um, and also do a little bit of other stuff too, um, but really grateful to be here. Um, I think a panel like this is needed. Um, it's something that I've been craving, you know, I think uh, talking about multiracial solidarity, like I think uh, we could always benefit from hearing more and more stories. And so I'm really grateful uh, to be a part of this and to also learn um, uh, from the panelists and, and just absorb uh, the brilliance in the room. Thank you, Johnny. I know we're all excited. This is, there's a lot of brilliance in this, in this room. Um, Kale, I'm going to go to you next and then Lulu, uh, will go to you to, to, uh, bring us home. One, um, yeah, okay, um, my name is KL Shannon. Um, I go by she, her, um, and I'm really excited that, you know, to be here to have this, this conversation. Um, I think it's, um, overdue, um, been a community organizer for a very long time. And, you know, I, I came about when, uh, when, um, you know, uh, Rodney King, when uh, the LA, LA riots broke out after the verdict on Rodney King, that's, you know, when I really uh, got involved in organizing and, and um, you know, a lot of the work that um, I was doing around was, you know, police accountability work. And, you know, uh, when, you know, Philadelphia had announced that they was going to uh, execute Mamia Abu Jamal, you know, so I, I've, you know, I've had an opportunity to be involved in a lot of uh, uh, different campaigns. And so, um, um, one of the campaigns that, you know, I'm currently very much involved, which, you know, it, you know, is, in my heart is um, children that are being uh, incarcerated, but being charged as, as adults, um, having you know children go through that experience. So um, uh, that's the work that I'm doing now, and my goal is to uh, see that we abolish um, abolish the decline because it it is a racist. Uh, 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 tactic and um it's harming black and brown children so um thank you and i, I look forward to this conversation thank you Kale. uh lulu hello can you hear me yes okay so my name is luz Viminda uzuri carpenter what up heidi jackson i see your heart I've never used this platform before. Well, maybe one other time. So I'm kind of confused about things moving along up my screen. Um, so my name is Luz Viminda Uzuri Carpenter. I also go by Lulu Carpenter. I also go by Miss Lulu as a teacher. Ate Lulu, which means big sister in Tagalog. Um, and, a, and I'm also Auntie Lulu. I have a lot of nieces and nephews chosen and blood as well. Um, yeah, and I also go by Lulu Nation, which is my host, which I started out with radio. So I go by she, her pronouns. Um, I'm currently just getting out of school right now. I'm a teacher um, and I had to sub for somebody who had who was sick and that's the reality right now. So I apologize for being late um, if that caused anybody disruption. So I started activism. I like that someone started that. My first act of activism, I remember like, being involved in MLK when I was in high school. And it was the same thing. It was like Rodney King. It was just like this big wake up call of like, I'm, you know, and before that, it was just like, I was the norm because I was a military kid or a military brat, as people say. And there was tons of me around. There was lots of black and Filipino people. I know that's a stereotype that, you know, most um, folks are from the military if they look and act like me. Um, but that was my truth. My mom's from the Philippines. My dad's from Jacksonville, Alabama real deep south 
on my dad's side. Um, he, he was, I was the first generation not born on the slave plantation. And on my mother's side, um, I'm the first person that was not born on a farm. So two farm kids found each other um, in, um, in the Philippines. So um, fast forward to coming um, around, I was just like, I just basically wanted to understand like my identity. That's how it started. I got my master's at Washington State University. And I remember doing this thing called the shared history. And I asked a teacher, I asked like two of my mentors, one of course was Asian and one was one was black. And I was just like, hey y'all, do you mind like talking to each other? I didn't think it was revolutionary at the time, but I was just like, can you talk about a shared history? Because y'all are not talking about that in my ethnic studies classes. So my activism really came about as a student and it was very black and it was very specifically Filipino. I was involved with the Filipino American Student Association. I thought it was very diverse, but then I realized that I was just hanging out with Filipino and black people. So <laughs> that's a little bit of my history. Um, and also I have a history here in Seattle when I'm talking about um, my deep roots in Seattle started with um, uh, the movement against sexual violence. You know, I did trafficking work. Um, Domestic trafficking, international trafficking, um, sexual sexual violence against youth, um, and domestic violence. So I really was there at the intersections, especially when people were talking about transformative justice, and like, if not prison, then what? Especially when it comes to that type of violence in our families and our homes, and that was a rough road entry to community, and it was a lot of people um, as survivors coming together, but also saying, and what about imperialism, and what about abolition. So at those intersections, I realized I was traumatized and decided to be a teacher of media justice because, you know, we all need a place to be. And that's where that's where I'm using my skills of like cultural work and preventative work. Um, I do believe I'm like, I'm going to be with the 10 and 12 years old and saying like, we're going to do something different and not reenact violence. And I'm going to we're going to heal now and in the future and many years forward from now. So that's me. And yeah, welcome to Duwamish territory. Thank you. Um, wow. I feel truly honored to be moderating this panel. Um, this is going to be such a rich conversation. So I want to share with our audience. Um, we're going to have, um, a conversation. I'll be asking some questions uh, for about 60 minutes. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for um, audience to share your questions. You can start doing that at any time during the chat. And we've got some folks behind the scenes that are going to be pulling those out and, and making sure we um, try and get to as many as possible. Um, and so I'm going to start out by asking a question uh, to all of our panelists so that you, you know, we'd love to hear from, from each of you, um, your thoughts from your own perspective. And, uh, and I've got a couple more like that. And then there's some that I'll probably direct to 1 or 2 of you based on uh, the kind of work that you're doing. And also, I want to encourage you, like, if you hear something from 1 of your fellow panelists and you want to respond. Jump in, like, you don't have to wait for me to ask you a question. Only thing I would ask, because this is all being closed captioned is that if you want to jump in, just like, raise your hand, either your real hand or there's, you know. One of those um, emoji hands uh, so that we know that you want to jump in that way. We can just make sure we're not talking over each other. So I'm excited to get started. Um, and I'll also say about the questions uh, that we did get input. From some of the panelists, so um, this is kind of co developed. We, you know, like thought about what uh, kind of issues we want to touch on and what are some of the questions we want to make sure we cover. So um, here's the 1st 1 to each of you. Uh, from your racial, gender, class, and generational background, how have you experienced the relationships, both the tension and the solidarity between Black and Asian communities in Seattle? And I'm going to change up the order, so David, you're not always going to go first. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to start with you, Alex, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, so I I didn't mention it in my intro, but um, so I'm Han Taiwanese. My parents are both immigrants from Taiwan, um, and Han ethnically. Um, and I I would say I the first thing that comes to mind is I graduated from Garfield High School in 2016, um, and was part of the 
APP program. I don't know if it's going by another name or, you know, but um, I don't think I was really aware of it or conscious of it during the time, but looking back on it and now like, you know, understanding the world that I do in the way that I do now, um, you know, that was a very formative um, and extremely violent um, system that I, you know, was a part of and was complicit in. And um, I think like what I can reflect on um, from that is, is just looking at how, um, so I guess I can I just explain or describe it to people that might not be as um, familiar with it is that it was like a sort of, I don't know if like magnet is the right term, but uh, there were white, wealthy and some Asians and some other people of color, but mostly wealthy people that would be um, bust in from other neighborhoods. Um, I grew up in West Seattle uh, into the Central District um, going to, from like Lowell Elementary School was my elementary school and then it would sort of like be out this like magnet um, to Washington Middle School and then Garfield High School. So um, essentially gentrifying these schools, gentrifying the music programs, um, which is really ironic. Um, the jazz program, for example, at Garfield um, and I think, and like, you know, seeing how resources were unevenly distributed within Garfield was one example, or how um, there were clear delineations within like the AP classes. If you walk by an AP class, um, it would be mostly white. Um, and, you know, how that also created um, like these, it, it further reinforced these racialized narratives, these anti Black narratives about intellectual or like, you know, who's smart or whatever, like who's serving, um, who's criminalized um, or who's criminal. And yeah, I think um, that is a very real and very like violent thing that um, I was a part of that I grew up within. Um, and I think like thinking about the model minority and myth and um, how like, I guess there were there was a specific type of it wasn't just any asian person that was a part of this program it was like select specific types of people um access to wealth whatever um and also thinking about how there were also other asians within garfield high school that um uh were maybe from like the cid they were coming in from the cid like and it sort of makes me think like what kind of solidarities or interactions existed within black students and those students those asian students um Com comparative to the program that I was in. Um, another thing that I was thinking about is just like that there was this um, narrative of Garfield being uh, very multicultural or like inter or, or like, you know, one of the most diverse high schools in Seattle. Um, and that was definitely something that I'd heard throughout my time there. Um, and just how much of a liberal lie and fallacy that was, like how much that covers up all the violence that was happening. Um, and so from there, I think like sort of, it, it was also complex. Like I I think when I was in high school, um, that was also the murder of Michael Brown. It was also when I um, was a, fortunate enough to, to interact with some mentors that I now have today, organizers in Seattle. And I think they showed me um, actually what solidarity looks like, what solidarity between black and Asian folks between native black and Asian folks, like that was the sort of mentorship that I encountered in high school that like completely flipped my world. Um, and so I guess there's sort of like that juxtaposition of the violence and the complicity and also this model of something else completely um, that really has influenced me today. Johnny, I see you nodding quite a bit. Do you wanna jump in? Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about my own experience of where I've seen both uh, Black and Asian solidarity and also ways, ways that I've seen tension. Um, and so when I thought about this, I actually thought about um, this experience or this moment of uh, the summer of 2020. Um, and so as folks probably remember, um, this was the summer of the you know, most recent uprisings, right? Like we experienced the murders of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, the list goes on and on. 
and it was pretty heavy, right? And it wasn't just here in Seattle. It wasn't just like all the umbrellas, you know, at the precinct. It, like this organizing, this um, people like, you know, rising up for action. This was happening everywhere, um, both like across this country and also internationally. And so if you've been to the Chinatown International District, you've, you've seen, you've probably seen like uh, murals alongside the, you know, I think like 12th and King. And it's, it's these images of, of black folks. It's these images of Breonna Taylor, Marsha P. Johnson, black mathematicians, you know, it's these, these art pieces that really, you know, immortalize, um, you know, black folks who have been, you know, wrongly murdered. Um, and also like black folks uh, that we can uplift and, and things of that nature. And so, um, just seeing the like art, the artists um, kind of like show up and like kind of like, uh, yeah, again, immortalize um, what's going on, you know, like um, it was a pretty like intense summer. And so having, um, and yeah, I guess I just want to like shout out the artists because um, I think, you know, there's intention behind, um, you know, placing your art and particularly placing it in Chinatown International District when um, there is, you know, Black folks around there and there are Asian folks around there. And I think um, seeing um, seeing our folks or seeing Black folks being immortalized in a neighborhood like Chinatown International, like that, you know, for me, like that does a lot for, for my own, like, sense of safety or just like, in some ways, acknowledgement. And so, um, that's one example of how I've seen um, that like black and Asian solidarity show up in a more like artistic sense. Um, and where I've seen the tension um, was also kind of that same time frame, that same time period. So uh, there was this Facebook group called Support the ID. And this was around the same time where the anti-Asian sentiment was really, really rampant. And you know, you would hear these like negative negative things about Chinatown International District, like, don't go over here, you might get COVID, you know, all of these really, really harmful, um, you know, negative things. And so this group, Support the ID, was this Facebook group where they would, you know, uh, show up, uh, go to restaurants, you know, take photos of their favorite meals, and people would do a lot of highlighting and, and showing, showing a lot of love for this neighborhood that was being, you know, uh, attacked on the media um, and it was a cool cool group and it grew and expanded and you know there was thousands and thousands of people um, that were part of this group and like everybody was showing love um, and so it was really really cool um, unfortunately um, what had happened is uh, like on that Facebook group um, there were black folks and particularly black trans folks who voiced concerns on a group of anti-Black sentiments. Um, and it was very clear that, you know, with thousands and thousands of people joining this Support the ID group, that it was very clear that <laughs> folks were divided on certain things. Um, so for example, some folks are like, you know, wanting more police presence to like, you know, uh, to kind of sweep the CID and, and, and so, um, When the black folks and, and black uh, trans folks uh, voiced their concerns of anti-blackness on this group chat, it was not received well. Um, and um, a lot of folks were either defensive, they were either dismissive, um, and it ended up kind of creating this like toxic environment. Um, and there were definitely um, Asian folks who did try to uh, hold people accountable, like hold, hold their own accountable of like the kind of like uh, toxicity that was on this group. Um, and so I, I want to name that, but um, it, you know, the Facebook group support the ID, it ended up having to shut down because it just, it just was not a safe space for black folks. Um, and it was, it's a shame, you know, cause um, it, in the beginning, it was just like this really incredible moment of folks like highlighting and showing love. 
Um, but um, I kind of just seen, you know, like when folks are divided, uh, you know, folks not willing to kind of engage in these conversations, you know, um, and I think when people hear the term anti black, um, you know, it's really easy to be defensive and dismissive and, and kind of be like, I'm not this or this, that, the third, but it's, um, it's not, that's not how you respond to like a, a claim like that, because like anti blackness is very, very serious and very, um, yeah, it's not something to kind of take lightly. Um, and so that's kind of where I've seen uh, the tension build up is uh, how how some folks respond to, I guess, uh, the feedback. Um, KL, how about how about you? What are some of your experiences? Well, um, you know, uh, growing up in the in the uh, central district. Um, you know, I always had uh, uh, an early understanding of the importance of solidarity b between uh, communities of color, and so um, I think, in 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 many ways, I you know I you know continue to develop that, and you know some through some of the collectives that I've been part of, like you know People's Coalition for Justice, that that focused on police accountability issues. And that was a, a collective that was made up of, of you know, black, brown, Asian folks. Um, and, you know, when I, you know, when I think about um, uh, a particular uh, incident of, of tension and solidarity, Black uh, Asian community uh, was uh, something that happened in 2015. A beloved uh, community activist leader uh, was killed, Donnie Chen. And um, he was caught in early morning gunfire and, uh, you know, he was hit. Um, and this happened in the heart of the international district. And, you know, of course, everyone was outraged. They wanted, you know, the, you know, the folks. Justice that and there and, you know, the mayor at the time was Ed Murray. And I can remember, um, you know, they, you know, Rumors were out there, stories were out there. Well, you know, it happened near one of those hookah lounges. And the hookah lounges were, you know, small businesses, you know, where people, where people, where the clientele could meet and, you know, smoke hookah, drink tea, converse. And it was mostly black, black folks. And the, and the small business owners were mostly black folks. And so there was a mandate that came down. We're going to shut down these these you know these hookah launchers because you know um, you know there's all incidents of of violence around these hookah launchers, and and that's why you know Donnie you know was killed, and so you know so it caused great divide among. The black community and the Asian community, great divide. But out of that, you know, our elders like Uncle Bob, you know, folks like Sawyer Young, you know, came together. And and you know, folks, you know, black folks, Larry uh, Musa, they were like, you know. We can't allow this to happen. And there was an actual community letter of love that was written. And, and it was, you know, distributed and it was um, read at, you know, city council. And it was, and it was young people. It was Asian American and black American young folks that said, 
we're not going to let you, you know, we're not going to let, you know, allow this to happen. You know, this, you know, what is going on here is anti-blackness and, and they were able to shut that down. And so a lot of folks don't know, know you know, know about it. It's one of the most powerful organizing um, stories um, about, you know, a time when black and, you know, black and Asian folks came together. Yes, there were, you know, you know, you know, Asian, you know, there were folks over here in the Asian community saying, you know, uh, you know, we want them brought to justice, whoever did this, you know, and as of today, they have yet to find, you know, uh, bring uh, the people that, you know, killed uh, Donnie. So, you know, that's, you know, some of what um, I've seen and, and experienced. And I just, you know, I, I think that's an important story to tell. That's such a beautiful example, Kale. I'm so glad you you brought that up. Solidarity. Um, and, and yeah, no, that's a beautiful example. I'm all of these stories. I feel like we could go deep and um, and really talk a lot longer than we have scheduled. Um, and I don't want to jump to new topics. And you've all raised a number of them, which go to systems uh, and institutions. But before we um, do that, I just want to make sure, um, how about David and then Lulu um, touching on this question? Do you mind if I jump on to what KL mentioned? Yeah, go right ahead, please so do. I just want to say, you know, rest in peace, Uncle Bob, but I remember that time of like, I was just like, oh yeah, and I forgot about that moment too, but specifically in Seattle, of like, it's that moment where you're like, is my elder going to do the right thing? And I think generationally, it was, it was important to know that Soya, I remember being, at the way I heard about it, it's at a community hub and where these community hubs of intersections and communities happen was Bush Garden and karaoke and Uncle Bob sitting next to him talking about this, right? And I wasn't involved in the direct organizing, but I felt, you know, I was like, oh, these are two communities of mine that are, but to see API folks do the right thing and that's not my history of people doing the right thing sometimes. Um, so, in summary, I'm trying to, but in regards to race, class, and gender, in my background is just like, as I said, like I'm the first generation off of the farm. <laughs> it's a whole long connection to nature. You know, Northwest is a very interesting place about land conversations. Um, so we should have that conversation. And at the same time, coming from a working class background of laborers, it's like very important to mention, you know, of like there's been solidarity amongst working class folks, specifically in the Northwest, when we talk about Filipino and black folks coming to Seattle, you know, as I told you, um, I wanted to find that history. So finding Uncle Bob and learning the history of the Gang of Four was really crucial to me, you know, and to see him and people that I call uncles, like um, Uncle, Uncle Gary um, folks, that were former Black Panthers talking to people in the Filipino community. And from there, it's just like going really deep for me of like people, um, for me, it was like the history of when we talk about gender and non gender non-conforming folks and trans folks, like I've always find, found solidarity in QD BIPOC communities where people were talking about being at those intersections or as survivors, people that were survivors and also organizers um, and experiencing violence and like having to be in alignment or in solidarity because of the violence that women and queer and gender non-conforming people were, were experiencing. Um, and so people had to organize at those intersections and just honoring that history. And there's a lot of history here in Seattle. Um, for me specifically, I wanted to say the organization Communities Against Rape and Abuse, um, it was the first time I heard about anti-Black racism before people were talking about it in other places. Um, and sex workers and other people that were organizing um as folks of color not being having to in order to get resources for people experiencing violence they had to come along come together um along those um at the margins of the margin so to speak so learning from the history of like api chaya um and communities against rape and abuses i'm uh, sorry communities against rape and abuse and northwest network which is a queer and trans all the letters, the alphabet of letters, people coming together because they were kicked to the side and kicked out 
of specific communities. And so they had to come together in alliance. And that is the root of transformative justice here in Seattle. It's all buzzwords now, but when we talk about solidarity, there's a lot of people, um, it was not, you know, it was not all roses and wine for people um, and how they had to come to that solidarity moment. It was a lot of struggle. Thank you for that, Lulu. David? Absolutely. Um, so let me, let me, let me say it like this. I, um, I, I was thrown away at 16 years old in the system. They gave me forever and I thought I was going to die in the box. And that, that was the reality of my circumstances. They did a lot of folks in my community. Um, a lot of us, a lot of young, young individuals. And um, my personal experience of I, my, when I was young, my mom was disowned, you know, from, from our community. So I really didn't have any really connection with the Asian uh, community uh, when I was coming up, except for my mama. Um, and, and it was, and it hurt though. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, the, the sense of rejection, I felt her rejection from her community that what she felt and then, and I internalized that as well. Um, but, but to go back when I was thrown away and, and we're in this negative environment, this, this horrible environment, I'm in there with individuals and, uh, other youth and we're able to connect and bond, um, which we have to, we feel like we have to, uh, um, and um, I think that's when I really uh, uh, got to really reconnect with um, the Asian community as, 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 as I see it. Like we were, the solidarity was real in there, cultivating real relationships in those circumstances. And, um, and that was powerful for me, you know, uh, 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 that, and that gave me the, the, the space to heal and, and really embrace all aspects of my uh, my culture, right? And and um, that was big for me. And um, and upon our release, as the, the laws changed and they started to release and allow for folks to, to to understand that when you're a child, your brain isn't fully developed, and so that giving a person forever in the penitentiary at such a young age is cruel and unusual, right? And we had the opportunity to petition, and so uh, uh, now that be on this side of the fence. Um, and being able to do this work together in community um, is, 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 is my understanding of really being able to see real solidarity around the work. Um, I, I think that uh, during, as you say, the latest uprisings, um, I think it was so important. I, I know it, I'm so sensitive to the fact of our, my community, our community has been through so much trauma and we get so judged for our trauma, how we bleed out in our trauma. And, and, and that's so impactful for me. You know, um, circumstances make you traumatize you and you, have, you create trauma responses. And then those trauma responses are so judged, right? And you're like, yeah, but these are responses to trauma though, like generational trauma. And, 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 and so I'm, I remember I had the opportunity and got invited to Asians for Black Lives. And, and I've seen so many Asians really supporting uh, so in, in a real way. And, and that was powerful for me to really be around that and be engulfed in that. And so um, that was uh, examples of, of what solidarity looked like. When you want to talk about tension, I think I spoke about it without speaking about it. You know what I mean? A lot of people criminalize our trauma responses and still hold these deep-rooted beliefs and stereotypes about our community and preconceived notions. And, 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 and a lot of tensions lie right there, especially when you're trying to be in some solidarity. And we all got to come together to dismantle these, these impressive systems. And sometimes it's difficult when we're all trying to heal at the same time. And so I, I, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you know, I'm really struck in listening to all of your um, stories and, and the powerful experiences that you're, you're sharing, um, you know, with this question of how how do we build solidarity? And there's you have shared so many different examples of that. And and how do we pass on knowledge? You know, I've heard some of you talk about you know sort of intergenerational and you know young people teaching older generations and our elders passing on knowledge to us. And so um, I want to explore that a little further. Um, you know, the role of education and building knowledge and how that uh, helps us to build solidarity. And um, looking at anyone you know who wants to jump in on that one. Can you say the question one more time, please? Yeah, and I kind of just 
made it up. <laughs> it's, um, you know, thinking about how we build solidarity and, um, you know, uh, educate each other, you know, young people educating elders and elders passing on knowledge to us. Um, some of it has been um, painful and racist, but other, you know, like in, in other ways, it's been so powerful in, in building um, a movement. And so just wondering if you could talk about the role of education and, and passing on knowledge um, and how we, how we do that. Looking at you, Johnny, because you're affirming. <laughs> yes, I do that. I shake my head. Um, but honestly, I think, you know, this education piece, like this, this is like a key point in, in how we show up in community, right? Is to like pass that wisdom, right? You know, um, folks have mentioned the gang of four, right? And that is like an example of like organizing, multicultural organizing, um, that it's possible, you know, like that we do have you know, our elders, um, and, you know, and for folks who did get a chance to organize and for folks to, you know, um, have relationships with them and, and to, you know, keep telling that story and, and that just be a piece of like how we show up in, in movement spaces, especially, you know, local Seattle organizers, like these stories need to continue to, to be told and, and also that we have to also be creating these stories too. And so, we also got to be, you know, building relationships with each other um, so that, you know, that the gang of four becomes the gang of like a thousand, right? Like that, that we can keep um, building these like solidarity lines, you know, it's no mistake that both like the CID and, and the central district were both redlined, right? You know, a lot of these communities are, uh, you know, yeah, they obviously don't go through the exact same things, but share share very like similar struggles in some ways um and part of organizing and part of like you know building building the movement is that you know truth telling um that history sharing and so i think in everything that you do as like a organizer as someone that shows community is there's got to be some level of political education um so that we can keep passing this down while also creating new stories um yeah because you know, I think, like I said this earlier, but you know, these these instances of solidarity, you know, between Black and Native folks and Black and Asian folks and Brown and you know, these are stories that like we should be lifting up and prioritizing. And in some ways, um, you know, these stories are happening, and and we might not, maybe we're not communicating, but like, you know, I know that for me, like I just believe that this is so like I've seen it show up in 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 the ways that I've organized with other like multicultural spaces, you know. Um and so part of it is like we also have to write these stories, you know, and make them, you know, whether it's like media, whether it's like um podcasts, radio, like we just have to be able to, you know, make these stories also digestible and like easy for people to kind of um hop in. And so that's what I would say. I think education um, and education in the way uh, it is, 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 is vitally important um, to understand um, when we're talking about solutions to a problem and you believe that they're uh, like the violent offender myth, right? It, it's a myth and, and they, they, it's created, right? And it's when they say that it's predominantly black and brown who they're talking about and they talk about solutions to, to fixing the problem and then somebody says, well, we can, I'm okay with supporting and helping nonviolent drug offenders, which is a white carve out, if you didn't know, right? And so you can see uh, the problem of not really understanding uh, uh, would, would lead, like we're trying to come together to solve a problem, how it can cause problems if you inherently believe that somehow a nonviolent drug offender is different or better in some sense, or, or more amenable to treatment or support than somebody who you deem violent, right? And And, and so I think that, that understanding is necessary for us to come together, especially if we're talking about real legitimate solutions. And I always like to say, like, if we understand trauma and how trauma shows up, then we can truly be there to support each other, right? 
if we don't understand that, it makes it difficult. You know what I mean? If you see somebody, uh, uh, he, if you, you see a person that doesn't want to, it looks like he doesn't want a resource. The reality is if you understand the, the historical impact and trauma and harm that's come from plugging into these systems and, 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 and watching your parent grow up and see how they were, how, how, how they were treated as they plugged into these, these systems, then you have some context to understand why there's some reluctance now instead of formulating your brain that they just don't want it. Right. You just don't want it. You just don't want to you, you don't want to change. You don't want this. And and and, and in a way, kind of um, justifying their circumstances like they're somehow there because they want to be there. And so I do think that that's hinged and connected to education and understanding and really. Um, and, 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 and having more context when it comes to historical context and stuff like that. Thank you. Thanks, David. I want to just jump in. Um, as as a teacher, I teach middle school. Love, I love middle school. It is a joy. If you do not, if you do not feel that comment, you should not be a middle school teacher. But I really do. I feel like this is the stage of transformation and change. Um, I love my students. Um, I'm blessed to do it every single day. When I think specifically of education, is like education was something that was oppressive to me because my history was not shown and I had to go and search out my history. So I love sharing history, but also the images that I had of black folks as a young person was just about the pain, right? And it was taught by white folks and like, and that's important history. And I'm not saying let's pretend like that didn't happen. What I learned later was like, I also need, you know, I need the struggle and I need the solidarity. So I would say in love and struggle and solidarity, right? Um, because when I learned the history of hardship and how people, despite all that, overcame that, and that there's a history that you have to learn history in a box of like this ethnicity or this ethnicity. At each moment, there were allies of color to each other. But when we say the word ally or whatever the new term is, okay, um, I forgot what the new term is, um, <laughs> you know, that people want to label themselves. But, um, it's always around what white people are doing, right? Instead of us being in solidarity with each other. And there is a long history. And for me, of course, I wanted to go search for myself of black and Filipino people. And there's a long history of black and brown people um, in solid black people in solidarity with other people. There's a long history of black people um, being their mo movements being co-opted and not not talked about and we have to do that in movement spaces of like yeah your lgbtq communities identify as queer and like that community has also was influenced by black folks um filipinos all the way in the philippines were influenced by black folks right um when we talk about what was happening in china when black panthers black panthers went to china you know that happened that was important um when we talk about like indigenous people here in Seattle, there's indigenous Filipinos. When we talk about um, black and Filipino struggle here in Seattle, there is a long history of black and Filipino babies. Hey, if you're out there. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's why I was also in love with uncle Bob too, because he had grandkids. I knew that he would love me, even though other Filipino people did not love me as a black person too, because uncle Bob loved me. And he showed that you could love your whole family and show something different. Right. Um, but there's a long history of like general Fagan in the Philippines, where he became a general after 20 black soldiers defected into the Filipino army and Filipinos raised up a sign and said, hello, my black brother, they are not treating you well in the United States come and be with us. Those are the, that's the history when we talk about Buffalo soldiers that um, the Marlies talk about, like literally black soldiers in the US Army were fighting for their freedom to say, I am, and the Philippines were like, you're not free, come with us. And so he defected, and there's a long history in the Philippines of black folks being in the Philippines. There's a whole tribe of black folks in the Philippines. There's a whole diaspora of black folks in Asian communities that we as black folks don't know about because they're not seen in the media. There's a whole history of black and Asian and solidarity and Pacific Islander solidarity that nobody talks about um, because we don't talk about allyship to each other. We don't talk about the whole history of how we came through for each other. In Seattle, there's the history of the KDP. 
and the Black Panther Party talking about the connection between the Filipino struggle and Black folks here. When we talk about the lynching of Ida P. Wells and her policies around anti-lynching, she was also speaking out about the colonization of the Philippines. You know, so we need to know our history because we are there and there are models of how we did that. And it's not just the Gang of Four, the history goes on in Seattle. And like, it's a blessing for me to see like, now there are words that younger folks and they're showing me like, even now as friends, they can call out me as an older person and saying like, hey, I also need to check colorism and anti-Black racism regardless of our identities. And so like this next generation, it's now their time to teach us as well as tell the history that we know. Thank Love you so much for that. Lulu, I can see really we are going to need to do a part two to this um, to this panel <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, I'm really um, uh, sort of aware or, or I want to bring to our attention, like our audience here is largely city workers. And um, I think all of you have mentioned different systems and institutions that are um, impacting um, you know, aggravating, uh, you know, the tensions and the conflict between black and Asian communities or our opportunities to build solidarity. And, you know, I've heard uh, you, Alex, talk about the school system and several of you talk about the criminal legal system. Um, and uh, so I'd, I'd like for you all to think about and, um, and offer your thoughts on, you know, what you would share with city employees who are um, listening to this today, um, you know, like the role that you see the city has played and uh, perhaps thoughts about the role you think uh, city, the city could play. Because um, here's an opportunity, right? Uh, and, and sometimes we think there's this big divide between community and city workers, but, you know, in, in truth, uh, you know, all of us working at the city are part of, you know, a community or a number of communities and um, and we don't want to um, you know have that divide exist, and we want to do um, to build bridges there, uh, and to be really aware and, and conscious of, of of the role that the city can play. So I open that up um, to you know all of you, whoever wants to share your thoughts. But you know, just thinking in terms of who's listening now, um, and from probably probably all the departments that we have in the city. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, I think it's important that um, we have that we continue to have these kind of conversations. Um, no matter how difficult or uncomfortable they are. Um, because um, it help us, it helps us grow. Um, and 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 that's the only that's the only way that we're gonna learn, relearn, and unlearn some habits. Um, I think it's important that you know we acknowledge you know our 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 struggles, you know our our collective struggles, and. Um, that we are all uniquely different, but we still can, you know, can come together in in, in solidarity, and and um, um, support one another. So I mean, that's what you know. I think that is so important, um, because you know. Um, there's all solidarity is there amongst us among black you know black and asian uh communities it's been there you know you know historically we've been pitted against each other so that, that that's what i would offer thank you Alex, we haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, sure. I think I can like sort of off of that point of pitting um, Asian black communities against each other. I feel like that makes me think about 
uh, the work that Johnny and I do with the egg rolls and Schumann in, in Little Saigon. And um, thinking about, yeah, how does the city play into that? I mean, I think it's uh, a really unique area of, um, well, first of all, we have this amazing mutual aid project going on and <laughs> it's really special. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it challenges this like stereotype of like who is in the CID. Like there is a lot of different types of people uh, in that block, in that area. There's black folks, white folks, uh, Asian elders, like there's a lot of unhoused people. Um, there's business owners, um, you know, just like folks walking around the CID. Um, and one thing I see happening in terms of like attention um, is, yeah, is the way that the neglect of this area has resulted in um, like exacerbating anti-black sentiments um, and calls for like more policing, et cetera, either from like uh, business owners or from people outside, like people like white people that you know live in the area that um, are you know scared of their safety or whatever. Um, th and this like uh, sort of like this isolation of this this idea that um, in sort of combination with what's happened, what's been happening with like you know Asian hate so-called Asian hate um, sh should be should be um, responded to with more police um, and that Asian safety is antithetical to uh, I mean I guess from I don't know if this is like an explicit thing that people um, like that is written but I think from my perspective like um, yeah, that Asian safety is antithetical to the liberation of Black people. Like, that is, um, I think, essentially what the conversation is about. And um, what the, uh, like, going back to the education piece, like, when we learn about the fact, like, the redlining in the CID and the CD, and, like, what Johnny was saying, like, there are similarities, not, like, they aren't the same, but there are similarities, and there are distinct, there's a distinct relationship between these two neighborhoods, as well as between Asian and Black communities. Like, you can see how um, it's not it's not just that there are solidarities um, historically that we can be learning from and being um, inspired by, but that our liberations are in fact in intertwined, and um, and that Asian people will not be liberated there, and their safety will not be delivered um, with more policing and with these inherently anti-black systems. And so, um, so I think the way that the city plays into this is like you look at what's happening. The CID, um, CID coalition is like a really big inspiration to me and like uh, educates me a lot. And so I, I see them talking about gentrification, luxury development, upzoning in the CID, and how that's um, exacerbated these tensions. Um, uh, just the general neglect. Like you walk around in on Twelfth and Jackson, and it's like you know there's trash everywhere, um, and I think like business owners, the what yeah, what we've experienced as business owners, um, some of them are you know like frustrated they don't, that like they um, their business has our business are like doing really poorly, um, and uh, that comes out can come out in these like very anti unhoused people like sentiments as well, and so how do you like hold the complexity of um, the anti blackness and the anti poor and anti homeless sentiments that come from this and also the histories and the conditions that create these like violences between communities is much more complicated than uh, you cannot, you cannot just say that, oh, it's this person that like individually um, attacked this Asian elder. Like that's, there's so much more context behind that. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, like policies that are currently ongoing historically and ongoing, um, like, you know, the recommendation for more policing, after the Atlanta shootings. Like that's not uh, the answer. And that is incredibly disrespectful to Asian communities that are um, like, you know, fighting for their own safety and their dignity to um, to define what safety and community safety looks like to themselves. There's so much there in what you said, Alex. And it's reminding me also of your example, KL, of, um, you know, uh, the mayor shutting down or, you know, ordering the shutdown of the hookah lounges you know, it's like whose safety is valued, right? And and how does that show up? Um, 
other thoughts about the city's role? Um, well, yeah, I can go. Sorry, I'm no. Go ahead. Oh, all good. You you got this. Um, so I was thinking about um, it was also in connection to the comment of like building solidarity. So I know it's just that people are already building solidarity. It's not like not happening, right? So it's just like the context in which we live. It's just not highlighted. And sometimes people, I what I realize is I feel like API folks and Black folks have been doing solidarity work for a long, long time. What you're seeing is only the the violence that pushes up against, you know, like people have lived in harmony, like all these communities where violence, of course, there's an underbelly of like tension rising, even in the central district, when we talk about like, who owns shops, you know, what are they selling, you know, hair shops in the city of Seattle, you know, like nail salons in the city of Seattle, people don't think of these things, but I'm like, I've seen businesses be respectful as I flare my nail. Um, be respectful to each other, right? I think it's a complex relationship of solidarity. And sometimes we think about solidarity in only activist terms, like we're all out here, but people are living their lives and surviving and crossing borders and, you know, and and they're here and they're doing the work to help each other survive, you know? Like people, someone told me like, when I think about the central district, I think about, and the South and I think about black people being welcoming you know, and that's complex in regards to, um, I'm not an indigenous person, so I'm like, in my history, but I'm like, I was welcomed because I was like, I'll be there for black folks, it, black folks will be there for me, you know? And that's how lots of communities have come into this central district. If they are there for each other, they live, they've lived as neighbors for a long time. They're the history of Japanese folks with black folks here, you know, just down the street on Jackson, where I am right now. When I think about the city specifically, I do feel like we need to talk about Monday money and who gets money and how they the how the institutions and they think that they're doing well, depending on what department, and people will placate you and even tokenize themselves in order to get money. And those money is being fil filtered to the wrong organizations that say they're doing work and they're not. I'm not gonna call out people right now. You know who you are. But it's also like, what kind of politics are they supporting? And oftentimes I feel like within government institutions, specifically the city, like there's a lot of things that people within the civil rights have fought for. And then they would rather hire a token black or brown person, someone that's going to be, that's light skin, that's pretty, that's skinny, um, that's white and Asian or Asian, or will be that model minority, or, you know, they're that kind of black person, but they're not, they're they're African immigrants, so they're better than the other black folks. You know, that's how we chase the money and we don't talk about it. So we need we need to talk about that but when we talk about solidarity. When no one is around, that's when solidarity happens. When you don't get brownie points, are you gonna stick your neck out for your coworker that's bringing up violence? Um, and people are seeing them as the angry black person. Is that Asian person who's like, you know what, let me be your token person versus that person that's going to be the angry, the stereotypical angry black person. Do you have your coworkers back? And oftentimes people will leave, particularly I would say black women out there speaking for everybody. And then when the doors close and the boss is not there, they'll say, good job, Lulu. Good job, Miss Black Woman. But recently I only had there, I remember I was in this organization and the only person that stood up for me was a black was the black receptionist that no one ever hears or talks to or is invisible. And I was like, why are all these powerful people, even folks of color, Asian and otherwise, not standing up for this black woman? What you need to do is have a backbone and realize like certain identities that are marginalized within the city and county don't have anything to lose. And yeah, you need to pay your bills. And at the end of the day, do you have your integrity? And do you know, like, if you're with community, community will always have your back. And I know tons of people in community that build that bridge between community and city relations and tell people what's going down. You know who you are. <laughs> That's my piece. I'm sticking to it. Put that on the air. Very important. Uh, and this role of, you know, how the city invests, where they invest, how much they invest. Um, another topic that we can expand on with a full panel. Um, that I would love to see. Um, 
David, Johnny. Yeah, go ahead, Johnny. I really appreciate all the, the bars that people are dropping. Um, so much wisdom in the room. You know, I think speaking about the work that Alex and I do um, at Schumann Tofu, Mutual Aid, um, providing, you know, food and, you know, PPE and other, other items, you know, and then thinking about, yeah, this narrative uh, that the city has been seeing, uh, you know, through the media, right? Like you've, you've heard this term, like Seattle is quote unquote dying, right? And so, you know, for a lot of folks who, who are doing the work on the ground, not just Alex and I, but the, you know, the tons and tons of folks doing mutual aid work, right? We're essentially trying to, we're, you know, we're doing like a counter narrative to like what the like mainstream media is doing. And so thinking about what is the city's involvement in that, you know, it would be to uplift, um, you know, to be like, you know, Seattle isn't dying or like Seattle is dying because people don't have the humanity for the people who are really going through it. You know, it's a, we need to flip the script of, of what the mainstream media is saying about what's going on. Um, and yeah, it is like up to us to like lift up our voices, but like, I feel like the city with all the resources, you know, should be really amplifying. Um, I think I would also ask every city employee who's on this call right now to, to talk to your team and really explore like what, what are the different levels of solidarity? Um, because there, there are levels to it, you know, it's not, it can, you know, there is that first level of just like, whether it's like signing a petition or, you know, doing something like that. And then there is like actually showing up and, and going to like marches and, you know, writing letters of support for folks. Um, but then you got to get deeper to that. Like the, you know, the next levels of solidarity, um, which essentially is like putting your body on the line or putting, you know, putting something on the line to, you know, support black folks, you know, to support, um, indigenous folks, you know, to support the communities who are really going through it, you know, and then even deeper than that, you know, thinking about how like solidarity is so much more like, you know, I remember hearing about this, this, this story of how like this community was offered, you know, these resources, uh, but it would be at the cost of another community not receiving those resources. And I think the city, you know, with the budget season and everybody, you know, asking for, you know, support, like we get pit into these like hunger games uh, situation. And it's like, it's super, you know, capitalistic and unfair, but it's like, you know, solidarity for me in its deepest sense is like deciding that even if this will benefit my community, if this hurts someone else's community, then I don't want it. And, and I, I would like for the city employees to really think about like, yeah, what are the levels of solidarity that your department is doing now? And what are they not doing right now? And how can they go deeper? Um, because we need, uh, we need a lot more than, you know, written letters of support. I mean, those are important too, but like, you know, for the liberation of, for black folks, for, you know, uh, Asian folks, for all, all oppressed peoples, uh, we need everybody. Um, and it, it just would be important. So I want to acknowledge, first of all, that I totally lied. We are, we don't have time for 20 minutes of Q and a, uh, because the conversation has been so deep. And I want to also say, like, we've touched on so many topics that we could go much deeper on. So I am, um, you know, really grateful to all of you. Um, so I do, there is a question in the chat, uh, Jennifer Cho. And if you'd be willing to, uh, you know, come off mute and ask that question, I'm asking our moderators to unmute her. Um, and because David, I, 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 you didn't get a chance to jump in on that last one. We'll bring it to you. Um, and because it is building on the same topic um, about, you know, uh, solidarity and, and the role of the city. Um, so Jennifer, oh, you're there. Can you? Um, Tell, you know, say more about your question. Yeah, I had, thank you, Monaco. And I'm just really um, appreciating everyone's sharing and honesty and transparency. And I think that's the only way that we can get to um, the solidarity that we're talking about. But my question is, 
I would really love to hear more about how we build solidarity in our Asian and black communities and how we heal from the division of white supremacy culture. And again, knowing that it is so complex and that our communities are not a monolith. So I understand there is not one solution. And I also understand there's not one answer, but I would still love to hear from um, your wisdom, your thoughts, your lived experience about how we build that and how we heal from the divide. Um, wow, that was, a, that was, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I, well, everything's a relate in relationship, right? I mean, we talking about how do we actually build relationships? I know sometimes we think about strategies and overall strategies and, 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 and I know the city that, uh, uh, it's built into the policies and the procedures and, the, and, and how things flow. But at the end of the day, it's about how do we, how do we cultivate, uh, legitimate relationships? And, and I think also about us, are we doing our individual work? Are we doing our work, dealing with our biases and dealing with dealing with us able to heal? You know what I mean? When you showed up to a space uh, um, and you're able to, with a full cup and you're, and, you, and, and, and you, you're not bleeding out, um, you'd be amazed how, how um, the, the connection that can be built when you're in space. And, and I think that, um, so I think that it's two pieces, right? I think we have to do our individual work and I think we have to, to, to do the work that and create the space for us to, to individually be able to heal from our unhealed trauma. And at the same time, um, think about leaning into authentic, real relationships with folks uh, in community. Um, it's, it's bigger than just overall strategy. I think we just need to start building real relationships and start, uh, um, it's bigger than just conversations. It's about how do we cultivate authentic relationships with each other. And so, but that I'll, I would say that, but I think it's all contingent on us doing our own personal work so that our trauma don't, doesn't show up to the conversation and, um, and uh, uh, keep us from connecting or, or, or cultivating true connection. I appreciate that, David. And I think that can be applied to that earlier question about what can we do as city staff um, dealing with our own stuff, right? Um, and I don't know because you, I did not give you a chance to answer that question if you had other thoughts about city role, because um, I know you've had opportunity to um, build some solidarity or be in partnership. What are things that city staff and what could the city be doing better? Oh, is that to me? Sure. Yeah. Oh, no, and I was just, I, I think um, to piggyback off what Lulu was saying of, about how the, uh, their policies, when it comes to how they distribute money and, and, and how, what that incentivizes and stuff like that. I, I think um, in the way in which they hand out money, right. With the, the, the expectations that they, that they, 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 their, their process might incentivize organizations with paid uh, grant writers that, that understand how to make it sound good, right? Or, or organizations that prioritize reaching out to a lot of people to fulfill a need, but doesn't fill anybody's individual needs, right? You don't actually solve the problem. You know what I mean? If you, you're you helping a lot of people a little, you know what I mean? And, and, and they get their numbers up and right and that might, they might prioritize that because they say, well, you served 3000 people, that's amazing. But did you support 3000 people? Did you really, you know what I mean? And, and so, I think that really looking at their policies and their procedures and their processes in a way, like how is that incentivizing the mess that we're in now? You know what I mean? You could rationalize it. We got all smart people and they went through all these big name schools and they could rationalize anything talking about evidence based and all this other shit. But is it really contributing to the problem? Is it actually going to get us closer to where we need to go? And, and that's actually solving these real uh, deep rooted issues that are in our community. That's real. Uh, in our last five minutes, anyone else want to um, respond to that question from Jennifer about building solidarity to address white supremacy? I think it's, I think that sometimes not to co-opt grassroots movements in Seattle, but I do think that there needs to be um, BIPOC caucuses um, that specifically talk about anti-Black racism and also like and all the things that people wrote in the chat um, and starting there and having conversations about that because sometimes we have caucuses um, but we don't have caucuses specifically to talk about those specific things you know that is a starting point and that is an organized point um 
and sometimes it talk a lot of people are using throwing this word but it's about mutual relationships um versus extractive relationships right so thinking about not just how um whether it's interdepartmental or it's like from a certain department out into the community thinking about how relationships could be long term and how those relationships specifically how will they break and how the history of conflict can get be infused um so you can educate and strategize at the same time department by department and then how do those departments um basically talk to each other for me the greatest experience i've had with the city have been people that either were um educated within the grassroots movements of seattle and then they learned how to translate for the communities what's happening at the top in the city to folks on the ground now there are strategic positions and um i really want people to grow that because when i think about funding specifically there are a lot of um, foundations that are doing um revolutionary kind of work in regards to how you can use your position whatever your position is in order to work in solidarity with others so we've got three minutes left and um it's i think it's clear from the comments and also our experience here we want to we want to take this conversation further and deeper um I want to close us out um, with a final question and just ask each of you to say in like one or two words, um, what is a value or, or values that you would share with our audience to build solidarity across Asian and black communities? What are some values or value that comes to mind? Let's make sure to hear from each of you. What's that, KL? Is that a thinking, a thinking strategy? Uh, can you repeat your question again? Yeah, what, val what? like I want to hear from each of you a value or values that you would share with our audience um, that you think we need uh, to ground ourselves in to build solidarity across Black and Asian communities. Um. I would say um, to, uh, again to have uh, to have the courage to have those uncomfortable conversations and be honest. Just be honest uh, with one another, um, and you know, just have the courage to have, you know, have those uncomfortable conversations, and um, uh, be willing to, uh, you know, step out there. When you know, uh, you know your black brother or sister is 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 being uh, treated, you know, treated badly because you know they're black. You know, have those uncomfortable conversations. Be willing to risk. That's what I would say. Absolutely, I would say, um, um, don't just make space for my brilliance. Make space for my trauma. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think that that's something that we 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 can all just hold center that, and when, when, whenever we come to space, I think, I think that would do a lot for us in um, the solidarity movement. Um, so Lulu, can you still hear me? I'm glitching a little bit. Yep. So I'm going to say karaoke. That's the first thing that came to my mind. But if you think about it, break it down to voice. Like, while I was karaoke with Uncle Bob, I saw Black and, and Filipino, I'm messing around, and other people as well, <laughs> Black and API people mixing, you know? Um, and you have to make room for the relationship building um, and to break bread together. That is really important. And at the end of the day, um, there needs to be, if you're going to struggle with me, I also need you to find joy with me because that's what we deserve. We deserve the celebration as well as the struggle. There's more, but there's only, that was only 30 seconds. <laughs>
karaoke will save your lives. That's it, kids. <laughs> as well as hip hop. I would say make space for multiracial organizing. You know, we have a history of it. I'm sure you've learned from this panel, um, but that there is there is beauty in, in building relationships and to think, I think it was Naomi Klein, it was one author that's, you know, said that the most renewable resource out there is relationships and being able to show up for each other, the ways in which, you know, you show up for your friends, but you show up for different communities, right? Um, you know, you that's how trust is built, right? Like, you know, I have deep trust for the people I surround myself with because, you know, we've shown up for each other, you know, um, and just kind of, yeah, reminding yourself that, um, yeah, there's, you know, I guess in the words of J. Cole, there's beauty in the struggle. Okay. Um, <laughs> But to, to show up for for each other and you know love so hard because the world is a, a scary place, um, but it's beautiful with other people. I'm hyping you all up right now. Be each other's hype people. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I have maybe a more negative angle, but it's for a positive reason. Um, don't play into like BS identity politics or be caught up in it, like resist that 100%, especially right now. Um, and like educate yourself on the uh, conditions and the context that have created the conditions that we live in. Thank you. And thank you all of our panelists. Uh, this was amazing, a beautiful, deep and powerful conversation. And um, Really, really appreciate all of you for joining this this discussion.